Welcome to lecture 34 on measure and integration. In this lecture, we will look at uh, some special spaces uh, which are uh, uh, which are constructed uh, on measure spaces. These spaces play important roles in uh, topics like functional analysis, harmonic analysis and so on. So, we will be studying today's spaces called LP spaces. So, we will fix uh, a real number between 0 and infinity p. So, p is a real number between 0 and infinity and we will look at uh, the space called L p mu, uh, which is also uh, written as L p of x s mu depending on whether we want to emphasize the underlying measure space or not. If it is clear from the context, what is the underlying set s uh, x and uh, the sigma algebra s we will just write this space as L p mu. So, this is a space of all complex valued s measurable functions on the space x such that integral of the absolute value of the function f raised to power p d mu is finite. You recall uh, in the previous lectures, we had uh, defined the notion of uh, function which is complex valued on a set x and which is s measurable and we also defined the notion of uh, its integral. So, if we take a function f which is complex valued such that the absolute value of this function raised to power p which is a non negative measurable function, if that is integrable integral of mod f to the power d mu is finite, then we say uh, the function f is p th power integrable and the collection of all p th power integrable functions on the measure space x s mu is denoted by either L lower p x s mu or just L p mu. So, L p mu is the space of all p th power integrable functions on x s mu and today we are going to study properties of uh, this set L p x s mu. So, uh, the first observation we want to make is that the space L p x s mu can be treated as a vector space over the complex numbers under the addition and scalar multiplication of functions. So, let us observe how that is uh, how is that done. So, we have got L p of mu. So, that is a space of all p th power integrable functions. So, we want to show that if we define f plus g x to be f x plus g x for every x and alpha f x to be equal to alpha times f of x. Then under this operation of addition and scalar multiplication L p mu is a vector space. So, for that we will have to show that alpha times f is a function in L p of mu whenever f is a function in L p of mu. So, let us check that. So, alpha belongs to c and f belongs to L p of mu. Let us look at we want to check alpha times f is in L p or not. So, we have to look at the absolute value of alpha f raised to power p and we have to show this is a, a integrable function its integral is finite. But it is obvious this is equal to mod alpha to the power p and mod f to the power p by the property of the absolute value. So, thus it implies that integral of mod alpha f to the power p d mu is equal to integral of mod alpha to the power p into in, uh, the product uh, mod f to the power p, but integral of a scalar times a function is nothing but the scalar times the integral of the function. So, by that property this is and because f belongs to L p of uh, mu. So, this is finite. So, if implies so this implies that alpha f belongs to L p of mu. So, scalar multiple of functions in L p are again functions in L p. Let us look at uh, the second uh, property namely uh, the addition. So, let us take two functions f and g belonging to L p of uh, mu. We want to show that mod of 
f plus g raised to power p is integral is finite, but let us observe. So, we want to show that this d mu is finite. So, let f and g belong to L p of mu to show we want to show that f plus g belongs to L p of mu that means integral of mod this to the power p d mu is finite. So, this is what we have to show. So, let us look at the function mod of f plus g. We know that this is less than or equal to mod f plus mod g by the absolute value of uh, by the absolute triangle inequality of the absolute value. So, this to the power p is less than or equal to this to the power p. And now, let us observe that the right hand side mod f plus mod g is less than or equal to 2 times the maximum value of mod f and mod g, because mod f will be less than the maximum of mod f mod g and mod g also is less than maximum of mod f and mod g. So, mod f plus mod g is less than maximum twice the maximum of mod f and mod g. So, this raised to power p, but that is same as we can take this 2 to the power p out. So, this is less than or equal to 2 to the power p and the maximum of two numbers is always less than or equal to. So, um, it is less than or equal the equal to the sum of those, those. So, let us first observe that this is actually equal to 2 to the power p maximum of mod f to the power p and mod g to the power p. And now, this is less than or equal to 2 to the power p mod of f to the power p plus mod of g to the power p, because maximum of two numbers is always less than or equal to the sum of the two numbers. So, what we get is that mod f plus uh, f plus g mod to the power p is less than 2 to the power p mod uh, f p plus mod f g. So, that gives us uh, uh, the inequality. So, integrating both sides we will get that integral of mod f plus g raised to power p will be less than 2 to the power p times integral of mod f to the power p d mu plus integral of mod g to the power p the d mu and both of them being finite. So, this is a finite quantity. So, that implies that whenever f and g belong to L p of mu, then mod of f plus g also or f or f plus g uh, the function f plus g also belongs to L p of mu. So, that uh, proves uh, that proves the fact uh, that L p uh, is a vector space over the field of uh, complex numbers. Next, let us define for a function f belonging to L p of x mu for L p, what is called the pth norm of the function, because f belongs to L p. So, the integral of mod f to the power d mu is a finite number it is a finite non negative number. So, we can take its pth root. So, 1 over p of this number is called the pth norm of the function f. So, norm f p. So, the lower index p indicates that we are taking the pth power of the function uh, to integrate and then taking the uh, pth root of the integral. So, this is called the pth norm of f. We want to uh, show that this p th norm has the following properties namely norm of p is always bigger than or equal to 0. And that is obvious because we are integrating a non negative function. So, integral of uh, mod f to the power p is always non negative. And if the function is 0 almost everywhere then of course, the integral is 0. So, the norm is equal to 0 and conversely if the norm of the function is equal to 0 is the p th norm is equal to 0 that means, the integral of mod f to the power p is 0 and being a non negative function that implies f of x must be 0 almost everywhere. So, this property uh, 1 is something similar to what we have done for when p is equal to 1 for the space of integrable functions. So, the p th norm of the function is always uh, bigger than or equal to 0 
and it is equal to 0 if and only if f of x is equal to 0. The second property that the norm of the function alpha times f is same as the absolute value of f, uh, absolute value of alpha times the norm of f. So, this double bar also indicates the absolute value of the uh, scalar alpha. That is again obvious because uh, once we, uh, that is obvious again because once we take the pth norm of this function. So, let us just uh, verify this fact namely for alpha belonging to C and f belonging to L p, if we look at the norm of alpha times f. So, that is equal to look at the function alpha f take the power p integrate out with respect to mu and look at the one pth root of that. So, but that is equal to mod alpha f to the power p is same as mod alpha to the power p integral mod f to the power p d mu raised to power 1 by p. And now, when we open it out, so mod alpha to the power p raised to power 1 over p is mod alpha into integral of mod f to the power p d mu raised to power 1 over p, which is nothing but the norm. So, this integral is nothing but the pth norm. So, that uh, proves the property namely that alpha times f pth norm is equal to mod alpha uh, times the pth norm. And the third property we want to prove is that the function f plus g, which we know if f and g belong to L p, then the function f plus g belongs to L p. So, we want to claim that this satisfies the triangle inequality namely norm of f plus g is less than or equal to norm of f plus norm of g. For uh, p equal to 1, this property was uh, obvious. We had uh, that followed uh, basically because mod of f plus g is less than or equal to mod f plus mod g. So, integrating both sides we got integral of mod f plus g is less than or equal to integral of mod f plus integral mod g. So, that means the norm of f plus g is less than or equal to norm of f plus norm of g. So, for p equal to 1 this is obvious, but for p not equal to 1 uh, we need to do some uh, more uh, calculations to prove this uh, result. So, we need first of all uh, we will first uh, prove it for the cases when p is strictly uh, bigger than 1. So, we will be looking at the uh, real number p which is strictly bigger than 1 and of course, uh, less than infinity. So, so for such uh, p uh, we need a, a lemma. So, which says that for every non-negative real numbers a and b if we fix t between 0 and 1 then the following inequality holds namely a raised to power t b raised to power 1 minus t is less than or equal to t times a plus 1 minus t times b. Uh, if you look carefully uh, for t equal to 1 by 2, this is just uh, saying that the geometric mean is less than or equal to arithmetic mean. So, that is, this is a generalization of uh, the standard uh, inequality that the geometric mean is always less than or equal to arithmetic mean. So, what we are saying is for any real number t, positive real number t between 0 and 1, for non-negative real numbers a and b, a raised to power t b raised to power 1 minus t is less than or equal to t times a plus 1 minus t times b. Of course, uh, if to prove this, let us observe that if a either a is equal to 0 or b equal to 0, then the left hand side is equal to 0 and the right hand side of also is equal to 0. So, uh, in that case it is a equality. So, if, if either a is 0 or b is 0, both sides are equal to 0 and there is nothing to prove. So, let us assume that the both a and b are not equal to 0. So, in that case let us observe that proving this inequality that a to the power t b to the power 1 minus t is less than or equal to a to the power t plus 1 minus t to the uh, times b is same as uh, we can rewrite this inequality as 
it, uh, this b raised to power 1 minus t is same as b times b divided by b raised to power t. So, that b raised to power t in the denominator we accommodate with a raised to power t. So, write this as a by b raised to power t and that b which was to the power 1 we shift it to the other side. So, that goes to a divided by b times t plus 1 minus t times b divided by b which is equal to 1. So, the required uh, inequality is same as proving that a divided by b raised to power t is less than or equal to t times a divided by b plus 1 minus t. Now, let us just uh, rewrite that. So, this is same as saying bring everything on all the terms on one side. This, so, that is same as saying 1 minus t plus t times a by b minus a by b times t is always uh, bigger than or equal to uh, 0. So, we have to show that this is always bigger than or equal to 0. So, let us uh, put uh, this quantity a by b as x. So, we have to show that for every uh, uh, x bigger than 0, we want to show that 1 minus t plus t x minus x to the power t is always bigger than or equal to 0. Now, realize the left hand side is a function of uh, x and we want to show that function of x is always a non negative function. So, one way of showing that would be that we look at this function f of x and realize that the value of this function at the point x is equal to 1 is equal to uh, 0. So, showing that this inequality holds is showing that f of x is always bigger than or equal to f of 1. So, let us write that. So, let us write the function f of x equal to 1 minus. So, let us write the function f of x is equal to 1 minus t times plus t times x plus x to the uh, sorry uh, minus x to the power t. Then let us calculate f of 1 which is equal to 1 minus t plus t x t x is 1. So, that is 1 minus x is equal to 1 minus t x to the power t. So, t is t is uh, x is equal to 1. So, that is 1 to the power t that is equal to. So, that is t times x. So, that is t and this is equal to 1. So, this is equal to 0. So, we want to show. So, to show that f of x is bigger than or equal to 0 which is f of 1 for every x. So, that uh, sort of indicates that we should try to show that this function f of x has got a minimum value at the point x is equal to 1. So, claim. So, there is a required inequality will be true if we can show that f of x has minimum at x is equal to 1. So, let us analyze and that is done by uh, using the tools of uh, calculus. So, let us use tools of calculus to analyze the maximum minimum of the function f of x which is equal to 1 minus t times plus uh, t of x minus x to the power t. So, we realize that this function is differentiable everywhere and we calculate the derivative of this function. So, that is equal to 1 minus t is a constant and derivative of t x with respect to x that is equal to t minus t times x to the power t minus 1. So, to calculate the critical points f dash x equal to 0 implies. So, this is t 1 minus x to the power t minus 1 equal to 0 and that implies x is equal to 1. So, uh, the function has a critical point at x is equal to 1 and to analyze whether it is uh, maximum or a minima, let us look at uh, apply the second derivative test. So, from here we will have f double dash of x will be equal to t is a constant. So, minus t into t minus 1 into x to the power t minus 2. So, at f dash at 1 that is equal to minus t into t minus 1 and t being a number between 0 and 1 
minus t is negative, t minus 1 is negative. So, this is bigger than 0. So, second derivative at the critical point 1 is bigger than 0. So, implies that x is equal to 1 is a point of local minima. So, that proves uh, the required property that the function has a local minimum and hence uh, the property that uh, so that proves uh, the property that the function f of x has a local minimum at the point x is equal to 1 and hence uh, the required inequality namely f of x is bigger than or equal to 0 is bigger than 1 holds. So, this proves uh, the lemma namely for any two non negative real numbers a and b and for a real number t fixed between 0 and 1 a raised to power t times b raised to power 1 minus t is less than or equal to t times a plus 1 minus t times b. And we will be using this lemma to prove um, another equality for um, our spaces LP spaces which is called holders inequality. So, let us state what is called holders inequality. Holders inequality says that for real numbers p and q, p bigger than 1 and q bigger than 1 says that 1 over p plus 1 over q is equal to 1. For such numbers p and q, if I take a function f which is in L p and look at a function g which is in L q, then f times uh, uh, g is a function which is in L 1 and integral of f g the absolute value of f and g product is less than or equal to uh, the integral of uh, mod f to the power p raised to power 1 over p and mod of g raised to power q raised to power 1 over q. So, that essentially says that the function f g is integrable. So, it has the L 1 norm. So, one can state the holders inequality as saying that the L 1 norm of f g is less than or equal to the product of p th norm of uh, f and the q th norm of uh, g. So, that is called uh, holders uh, inequality. So, let us uh, prove this holders inequality. So, we have got uh, two functions uh, f and g. So, f belonging to L p and g belonging to L q, where 1 over p plus 1 over q is equal to 1 and we want to show that the norm f g is less than or equal to the p th norm of f and the q th norm of g. So, this is the inequality we want to prove. So, let us observe first of all note let us uh, if uh, let us observe, uh, let us call this uh, uh, if norm of f equal to 0 or norm of g is equal to 0, if either of these two quantities are equal to 0. So, what will that mean? So, norm of f equal to 0 implies integral of mod f to the power p d mu is equal to 0 and that will imply that the function f x equal to 0 almost everywhere and that will imply that the function f g equal to 0 almost everywhere. So, if norm of f is equal to 0, then the function f g is equal to 0 almost everywhere. So, this L 1 integral of this equal to L 1 norm of the function f into g is also equal to 0. So, both sides will be equal to 0. Similarly, if norm of g is equal to 0, then again both sides of uh, the inequality will be 0 and this will be a equality. So, the required inequality holds as an equality if either of norm f or norm g is equal to 0. So, let us suppose that norm of f p is not equal to 0 and norm of g is also not equal to 0. So, we are now going to uh, apply uh, the lemma. So, let us consider the case, uh, special case when t is equal to 1 over p and the number a 
is equal to mod f divided by norm f to the power p uh, norm f the whole thing to the power p and b is absolute value of g divided by norm of g raised to power uh, q. So, we are going to apply uh, the lemma namely a raised to power t b raised to power 1 minus t is less than or equal to t times a plus 1 minus t times b with t equal to 1 over p a equal to this number mod f divided by norm of f whole to the power p which is defined because norm f is not 0 and similarly b equal to norm of uh, absolute value of g to, uh, divided by norm of g whole thing raised to power q. So, when we do that, so t raised to power 1 over t. So, this is t uh, a. So, mod f whole to the power p. So, that gives you mod f. So, that gives us mod f divided by norm of f and b raised to power 1 minus t and note uh, 1 minus t is 1 minus 1 over p which is equal to 1 over q. So, that gives you uh, norm of uh, absolute value of g divided by the norm of g. So, that is the left hand side of the inequality is less than or equal to t which is 1 over p times a. So, a is mod f divided by norm of f p whole raised to power p and similarly uh, uh, 1 minus t which is 1 over q and b uh, which is nothing but mod g divided by norm of g to the power 1 by q. So, this is uh, the application of that inequality and let us now uh, simplify this a bit further and now observe that. So, mod f mod g divided by norm f norm g is less than or equal to 1 over p times this quantity. So, let us uh, integrate both sides with respect to mu. So, that will give you integral of mod f g d mu divided by norm of f norm of g because these are just constants is less than or equal to 1 over p which is a scalar and mod f to the power p d mu mod f to the power um, uh, integrate both sides. So, that gives you the norm of uh, f to the power p and so this is also norm f uh, to the power uh, p. So, that gives you 1 over p plus 1 over q and that is equal to 1. So, that gives you so, integrating both sides we get that norm f g is less than or equal to norm of f p norm of g uh, q. So, that is called uh, Holder's uh, inequality. So, let us uh, go back to uh, a re revise this again what is called Holder's inequality. Holder's inequality says that if p is bigger than 1 and q is bigger than 1 say that 1 over p plus 1 over q is equal to 1. Then for function f belonging to L 1 L p and g belonging to L q the product f into g is in L 1 and its integral is less than or equal to the norm uh, p th norm of uh, f into p th norm of g. So, once again let us go to the proof. So, we write uh, a as the norm of f and b as the norm of uh, g. So, if either a is 0 or b is 0, then either the function f will be 0 or the function g will be 0 and both sides of the inequality will be equal to 0. So, the required claim will hold. So, let us suppose a is not 0 and b is not 0. So, then we can divide by a and b. So, let us write uh, a to be norm f, uh, a to be absolute value of f divided by capital A. What is capital A? Recall capital A is the norm of f. So, whole thing raised to power p and similarly b is g x absolute value divided by the norm of uh, g raised to power q and t equal to 1 over p. So, apply the lemma. So, the lemma will give us that a raised to power t is 1 over p. So, mod f over a and the 
into g times uh, into b times b raised to the power 1 minus t will give you g divided by b is less than or equal to t times. So, t is 1 over p applied in times uh, a. So, that is a plus 1 over q times uh, b. So, that is now integrate both sides uh, with respect to mu. So, integral of f g with respect to mu is less than or equal to integral of f p which is nothing but a to the power p. So, that cancels out. So, integral while integrate this cancels out, this cancels out. So, this is 1 over p plus 1 over q and this a b you can take it on this side. So, that gives you that uh, integral of f x g x is less than or equal to a times b which is a norm of f times norm of g. So, this is uh, called Holder's uh, inequality. Using this inequality, we will prove uh, another uh, uh, inequality which is called Minkowski's inequality, which is essentially uh, the triangle inequality for the L p norm. So, it says that if f and g are in L p, then of course, we have already shown that f plus g is in L p and the claim is that the norm of f plus g is less than or equal to norm of f plus norm of g. So, uh, this uh, will prove using uh, Holder's inequality. So, let us start the proof. So, for p equal to 1, we have already analyzed the proof and uh, so seen it is easy. So, let us assume p is strictly uh, bigger than 1. So, when p is bigger than 1, let us look at uh, the function. We know f plus g belongs to L p. So, look at uh, the function f plus g raised to power p minus 1. So, note that uh, we have the special relation between uh, p and q namely 1 over p plus 1 over q uh, is equal to 1 and that is same as saying the number p is also uh, written as p equal to p minus 1 times uh, q. Right? So, that is uh, falling from uh, this is from the inequality. So, this is coming from the equality that. So, let us just uh, recall that we have seen we have seen that uh, 1 over p plus 1 over q is equal to 1. Okay. So, that says cross multiply. So, that says q plus p is equal to p q and that says that p is equal to p q minus q. So, that is same as saying from here q is common. So, p minus 1 times q. So, that is one observation that if p and q have the relation 1 over p plus 1 over q is equal to 1, then p can be written as this. So, once that is true, let us look at uh, the function which is. So, consider the function which is mod f plus g raised to power p minus 1. We want to claim that this belongs to L q. So, for that because the reason for that because the reason is mod f plus g raised to power p minus 1. So, we want to now raise it to the power q integral d mu. So, what is that? So, that is equal to integral of f plus g p minus 1 into q that we have already seen p minus 1 into q is p. So, that is equal to p d mu and that is finite. So, that proves that uh, if f and g are in L p, then mod f plus g raised to power p minus 1 is in L q. So, this observation uh, will be used soon. So, let us uh, write consider the Holder's inequality with the functions mod f into f plus g raised to power p minus 1 and mod g into mod of f plus g raised to power p minus 1. Note f is in L p, this function is in L p and f plus g uh, raised to power p minus 1 is in L q. So, by Holder's inequality, this function is integrable and its integral is less than or equal to norm of f plus norm of this function. Similarly, g is in L p and f plus g raised to power p minus 1 is in L q. So, once again this product will be in L 1 and Holder's inequality will uh, apply. So, we start the proof 
by observing that mod f times uh, mod of f plus g raised to power p minus 1 with this function being in L q. So, this is in L p, this is in L q. So, the product is L 1. So, that will be less than or equal to the p th norm of f that is the p th norm of f plus the q th norm of this function mod f plus g raised to power p minus 1. So, what is the k th norm? So, it is f plus g the function is to the power p minus 1 for the k th norm raised to the power q the whole thing raised to power 1 minus q and that is same as this p minus 1. So, this is equal to uh, this one we have already seen it is equal to p. So, so this thing is uh, norm of f plus g uh, raised to power p raised to power 1 over q. So, this integral is nothing but uh, norm of f plus g raised to power p by q. So, we get the inequality using holders inequality namely uh, the product of the function mod f and mod f plus g raised to power p minus 1 is less than the p th norm of f times the, the p th norm of f plus g raised to power p by q. A similar application of Holder's inequality to the second function will give us that the mod of g times mod of f plus g raised to power p minus 1 is less than the norm of g times the p th norm of the second function which is nothing but mod f plus g raised to power p by q. So, now let us uh, use these two uh, to calculate the norm of f plus g. So, to calculate the norm of f plus g let us raise it to the power p. So, the p th power of the norm of f plus g is nothing but integral of mod f plus g raised to power p. And now, uh, the trick is that this power p we write it as uh, p into p minus 1. So, this integral is nothing but integral of f plus g raised to power uh, 1 into the same thing raised to power p minus 1. So, this number mod f plus g absolute value is written as mod f plus g and times mod f plus g raised to power p minus 1. And now, the first uh, absolute value f plus g we use triangle inequality this is less than or equal to mod f plus mod g. So, this is by uh, triangle inequality from here and now this integral can be split into two integrals. So, the p th power of the p th norm of f plus g will be less than or equal to integral of mod f times mod f plus g raised to power p minus 1 plus integral of mod g times uh, that and then we will use uh, the earlier uh, uh, obtained bounds. So, we got uh, this is less than or equal to this integral plus this integral and this here we are using that holders equality the bound we have obtained. So, this integral mod f times mod f plus g raised to power p minus 1 is less than or equal to the p th norm of f and the q th norm of this function and the q th norm of this function is mod f plus g raised to power norm raised to power p by q and similarly, the second term is less than norm of g times the norm of f plus g raised to power p by q. Now, this norm of f plus g raised to power p by q is common. So, let us take it out. So, this is less than or equal to norm f plus norm g times norm of f plus g raised to power p minus uh, p by q. So, on the left hand side if you recall we had the norm raised to power p and now on the right hand side we have got the norm the one term is norm raised to power p by q. So, take it on the other side. So, we get norm of f plus g raised to power p minus p by q is less than or equal to norm of f plus norm of g. And now using the fact that 1 over p plus 1 over q is equal to 1 realize that this number is nothing but p common. So, 1 minus 1 over q uh, that is equal to 1 over p. So, that cancels. So, this number is equal to 1. So, we get what is called holders inequality which is also same as the triangle inequality for the p th norm namely norm of f plus g is less than or equal to norm of f plus norm of g. 
So, that is uh, called Minkowski's uh, inequality. So, uh, what we have uh, what we have shown is the following that for uh, the space of uh, p th power integrable functions uh, is it is a vector space uh, one and secondly for every function f in this space we can define its uh, lp norm which is the integral of absolute value of uh, uh, the function mod f to the power p the whole thing raised to power 1 over p and we have just now shown it has uh, uh, the three properties uh, namely uh, the norm lp norm of a function is bigger than or equal to 0 and it is equal to 0 if and only if the function is 0 almost everywhere and second property that the lp norm of alpha times f is equal to absolute value of alpha times the norm of p and the third uh, the triangle inequality namely norm of f plus g is less than or equal to norm of f plus norm of g. So, uh, so, as in the case of L 1, uh, let us identify functions which are equal almost everywhere. So, for f and g in L p, if we identify functions which are equal almost everywhere, then we observe that the norms of these two functions are same. So, norm of a function f is equal to the norm of a function g, if f and g are equal almost everywhere. So, if we identify functions which are equal almost everywhere. Uh, we will get their norms to be same. So, uh, we will do that. So, in, in L p, we will not distinguish between functions which are equal to 0 almost everywhere. So, with that understanding, let us define uh, the distance between two functions in L p to be d f g equal to norm of f minus g with respect to p. So, once we do that, this becomes a metric on L p. So, d f g is a metric on uh, L p, because uh, d f g equal to 0, if and only if f is equal to g almost everywhere and we have identified functions which are equal almost everywhere. So, this becomes a metric and it is called the L p metric on uh, L p metric uh, on the L p space. And uh, uh, like L 1, uh, one um, claims uh, what is called Ries Fisher theorem, namely the space L p is a complete metric space in the uh, under this the metric L which is called L p metric. And the proof of this theorem is uh, verbatim same as the proof for uh, saying that L 1 of a b is complete. So, we will just sketch the proof and uh, ask uh, you to uh, verify the steps. Uh, which will also help you to revise the earlier proof and if you still have difficulty you can uh, refer to the textbook. So, the steps of the proof are as follows. Let us take a Cauchy sequence in uh, L p. We want to show that uh, this Cauchy sequence is convergent in L p. So, for that the first step is because this sequence is a Cauchy sequence, we can select uh, integers positive integers n 1 less than n 2 and less than n k such that the consecutive difference between f n k plus 1 and f n k is less than 2 to the power minus k. Now, because Cauchyness says the elements of the sequence are going to come closer and closer uh, as you uh, go to infinity. So, using that uh, we can uh, select inductively uh, integers n 1 less than n 2 less than n k and so on such that the difference between f n k plus 1 and f n k is the norm is less than 2 to the power minus k. Once that is uh, done, let us define g k to be the function mod f n 1 plus the sums 1 to k of the differences f n j plus 1 minus f n j for, uh, for every k we define this sequence. Then uh, this uh, 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 g k is a function claim is that if you take the power of this to the power p of this, then uh, this function uh, g k to the power p with the L 1 uh, norm is uh, uh, actually we should be uh, defining this modification we should make f n 1 to the power p plus f n uh, 1 f n j plus 1 minus f n 
mod to the power p. So, uh, this one will require that you define. So, there is a, a misprint here, this should be mod f n to the power p plus mod of f n j plus 1 minus f n j absolute value to the power p. So, that is g k. So, once that is then if you integrate both sides, then we get that this is less than or equal to this power p is here. So, integral of the power p, so that is gives the norm of the function uh, f n 1 uh, to the power p and uh, this to the power uh, p that is uh, uh, finite. And hence, this g k s uh, will uh, belong to g k s will belong to uh, L p space. And now, as a consequence of uh, uh, monotone convergence theorem, the series form if we define g x, then uh, uh, using uh, series form of the dominated convergence theorem, one uh, shows that this function g also is in L p and hence deduce that this integral of mod f n 1. So, g k uh, this is finite and hence uh, the function f i x f x which is the partial sum uh, which is the sum of the series f n 1 x minus this is exists almost everywhere. And so, as a consequence uh, we will get this f n k because the partial sums are just f n k that converges to f of x. And now, uh, an application of uh, uh, dominated convergence theorem again gives you that f belongs to L p and the integral of mod f n k plus 1 minus f to the power p uh, converges to 0. So, norm converges. So, the proof is essentially uh, the same as that of L 1. So, uh, I have just outlined the steps, uh, try to uh, prove this uh, steps yourself and convince that uh, it is ok. So, this is what is called uh, the Reese Fisher theorem. So, this is we have proved it for uh, p bigger than 1 and less than infinity. One can ask the question that what happens uh, uh, for this uh, number p between 0 and 1. Uh, for p between 0 and 1, when you can define these spaces uh, called L p spaces and show they are metric spaces. However, there is a problem that uh, when you define, when if you try to define the norm as integral of uh, mod f to the power p raised to power 1 over p, that does not satisfy the training inequality. So, one can define uh, a metric d f g to be for p between 0 and 1, we can define the metric to be the integral of the absolute value f minus g to the power p, but that does not uh, really help. It becomes a metric, one can show it is complete also, but the problem comes that uh, f going to norm, uh, if you define that norm, it is not a norm. So, uh, integral of mod f to the power p is not a norm. So, the triangle inequality uh, fails. So, that is why uh, for p between 0 and 1, these spaces are not very uh, interesting uh, for applications point of view. Another observation, now one can, one can also define what are called L infinity spaces. Namely, uh, you look at, uh, you say a function f defined on x is essentially bounded if uh, there exists a real number m such that the measure of the set where mod f x is bigger than m is equal to 0. So, you collect together functions which are essentially bounded and call them as L infinity. So, one can show that L infinity is a vector space and if one defines for a function f in L infinity, what is called the infinity norm, L infinity norm to the infimum of these constants m says that the measure of the set where f x is bigger than m is equal to 0, then one can show that this indeed is a norm uh, on L infinity and is called the essential supremum of f. And one shows that if we identify functions f and g to be same if they equal almost everywhere, then this f going to L infinity is a norm. So, that uh, gives a metric uh, norm namely the distance between f and g to be norm of f minus g. And this uh, uh, indeed uh, is a metric and one can show that L infinity becomes a complete uh, metric space like uh, L p for p bigger than or equal to 1. So, uh, these are examples of uh, metric spaces 
which arise out of uh, measure theory. So, let me uh, the importance of this uh, uh, lies in the following fact. So, whenever we have one is given a vector space and a norm is defined on it, that space is called a norm linear space. And every norm give rise to a metric. So, the metric being the distance between f and g to be the distance uh, the norm of f minus g. So, that gives a norm and if under that norm, under that induced metric induced by the norm, if this vector space becomes complete metric space, then the space is called a Banach space. So, L p spaces p bigger than or equal to 1 including L infinity are examples of uh, Banach spaces. And uh, the space p equal to 2 is a very special uh, space, uh, then one can even define the notion of angle and relate distance and angle. So, L 2 gives examples of uh, a Hilbert space. So, uh, today we have looked at uh, L p spaces which give very important examples uh, of norm linear spaces, in fact Banach spaces and also L 2 gives example of a uh, Hilbert uh, space. Uh, all these spaces play an important role in the subject of functional analysis and in harmonic analysis. So, uh, if you go for higher studies, you will come across these spaces again in your uh, studies. So, uh, let me stop here today. Uh, thank you.